Folks, this is Shock, and I'm going to go through six reasons to believe that God exists. Six rational, plausible reasons, all using deductive argumentation, to believe that God exists. We're going to go through six of them while we're on the freeway here. Now, I can go through more, but I only have about 15 minutes for the video. So before we start, also I want to tell you, if you guys want to get your own conference room, it's a video conference room, and voice conference room, and they have a free version of it, if you go right here below, shockonnow.net, and click at the top where it says, own a chat room, you can go there and sign up for your free version of the chat room. I have the one that's the paid version. It's like $8.95. I love it. And we've been bringing lots of folks to Jesus Christ because I've been going through this. You could also do uh, PowerPoint presentations in your chat room. So don't forget when this video is over, go right here below, click right below shockandout.net, click own a chat room. And in 30 seconds or less, you'll have your own chat room. So let's go up here by this yellow Corvette on the right. And let's start, and we're going to go through, not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, five but six. <laughs> six reasons to believe that God exists. Number one, first let's go through them and then we'll define them a little bit. The ontological argument, the cosmological argument, the argument for fine-tuning of the universe, known as the teleological argument. Why is this guy <laughs> putting his brakes on? Um, also the, uh, <laughs> the lady putting her brakes up. I went to get the left lane, there was a car there. So where was I? Ontological, cosmological, teleological, uh, the historical person of Jesus Christ, argument for objective moral values, that's number five. And number six, if I could do it, number six is experiential reality, experiencing God in your life. So let's start with the ontological argument. It's already been about two and a half minutes. And here we go. The ontological argument basically deals in possible worlds and actual worlds. Now when we're talking about a world, we're not talking about a planet or a universe. We're talking about the way things are in reality. So what you do with the ontological argument, I got to get the left lane here and punch it right through here. Let's punch it. What you do is you show that in this world, in this actual world, that God can exist. You could also do this simply by getting the Bible and um, showing that the Christian God is clearly compatible with the way the world operates. And what your atheist opponent would have to show is, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm losing my voice because I'm yelling. What your atheist opponent would have to show is that it's impossible for God to exist in any possible world, in any actual world. Now, when you go to shockandout.net and you click on a chat room, also click links and you can see the ontological argument. Um, a lot of people I debate don't understand the ontological argument. A lot of atheists are like, I don't understand, you know, their minds can't grasp it. Now let's go to the cosmological argument. The cosmological argument basically is an argument that says, Number one, premise one, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Number two, the universe began to exist. So number three, therefore the universe has a cause. Now the cause cannot be a natural cause. It has to be supernatural because even prior to this quote unquote singularity, prior to what people call the Big Bang, etc., there was no matter, energy, space or time. So Lawrence Krauss, for example, uh, is very dishonest when he says, oh, a universe could come from nothing. What he's talking about is energy. And, and he even admits it. He goes, well, when I say nothing, I don't mean nothing, you know. Look, nothing has no properties to it. Nothing is nothing. Out of nothing, nothing comes. So basically, the cosmological argument, you show that it can't be something within time, space, uh, because there were no time, space, even matter, or energy prior to this so-called 
Big Bang that atheists like to talk about. Even Stephen Hawking admits that the universe had a beginning. Well, if it had a beginning, it's not eternal. There must have been a cause, and whatever begins to exist has a cause. God never began to exist. He's timeless. Therefore, he doesn't have a cause. But we do know that science does prove that the universe began to exist. So we know the universe had a cause. The skeptic of God cannot figure out a way to explain how the universe created itself out of nothing. So they'll use like Lawrence Krauss dishonest tactics to say nothing when they really mean energy. But even if he does that, he still fails because there was no energy prior to the so-called Big Bang. Okay, the fine-tuned argument, this is number three, the teleological argument. There's about 50 constants that need to be extremely fine-tuned. What a constant, what a constant is, these are different ratios like entropy. Um, or, for example, Stephen Hawking even says that the rate of the expansion of the universe would have been just slightly different if the universe would have died. Now, if you get any of these constants, there's about 50 of these fine-tuned constants, and you were to adjust some of those constants just slightly, the universe would cease to exist. I wouldn't even be here riding this motorcycle making this video. There would be no life, no life at all. Now, the argument goes like this. The fine-tuned universe cannot be due to dumb luck or chance. It, but it's either dumb luck or chance, or something in natural law, like physical necessity, or design. Since the fine-tuned universe, this is the teleological argument, the fine-tuned universe is plausibly neither due to dumb luck or chance or physical necessity, therefore follows logically that the fine-tuned universe is due to design. This is a, a rational, plausible conclusion to this argument. So we did ontological, cosmological, teleological, and then now let's talk about Jesus Christ. Most New Testament scholars do agree on these uh, things I'm going to go through with you, but we're getting a lot of them over here. They agree on the empty tomb, they agree on Jesus' post-mortem appearances, that's the eyewitness accounts of Jesus after he resurrected, and they also agree that the disciples believed that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. They believed it so much they're willing to die for the truth of that belief. So the more plausible reason why they did that is because it really happened. Um, there is no naturalistic view that makes sense of it. So this is another argument for God's existence because Jesus Christ did claim to be God and if he was risen, then this is vindication of his claims, therefore giving more proof and evidence on the side of God's existence. So we just did ontological argument, cosmological argument, teleological argument, Jesus Christ, we got two more arguments. The objective morality argument. You know, when I'm debating with atheists, and you can go right here below, shotgunout.net, click uh, inner chat room, you'll see it there. Um, they do agree that there are things in the world that are always wrong and there are things that are really good and things that are really evil. For example, if you believe that we're just uh, evolved primates with no soul, nothing, uh, and there is no God, if you believe this, then it's very difficult, and a lot of atheists agree, it's difficult to explain why objective morality exists. We even see it in our court system. Rape is always wrong. When I'm debating with atheists, I ask them in front of everyone in the room, and they don't dare say, well, no, it's not wrong. I ask them, do you believe that rape is always wrong? And they say, yes, rape is always wrong. This is objective morality. Now, in the animal kingdom, you see rape all the time. Why do we have this objective morality with humans? This is a problem for people that say God does not exist. If you agree that rape and, you know, torturing kids for fun is always wrong, 
then you agree that objective morality exists. If you agree that, by the way, when we're talking about objective morality, what we mean is that when the Nazis killed the gypsies, the homosexuals, and the Jews, when they just basically committed genocide and killed them, if you agree that that's wrong, then you would agree that it's also wrong, even if the Nazis would have succeeded in taking over the world and killed everyone that disagreed with them, it would still be wrong. That's what objective morality is. It's wrong whether the psychopath thinks it's right or not. So we just covered, number one, the ontological argument, number two, the cosmological argument, number three, the teleological argument, the argument about fine-tuning, number four, Jesus Christ, and number five, if there's a motorcycle up there, see if we can catch up. Number five, um, objective morality. Now, we're going to talk about ex experience. What you experience, experiential reality. See, when Jesus uh, was crucified, prior to that, here's what he said. He said, look, it's better that I go, because when I go, I will send the helper, the pedagogy. I will send the helper to you, and when he comes, he will convict the world. Now, that's everybody. That's just not Christians. Uh-oh, the truck's getting over. I'm catching up to the motorcycle, slowly but surely. So Jesus said he will convict the world of these three things. Sin, righteousness, judgment. And then he said, what that meant. He said, sin, because they do not believe in me, because all of our sins are forgiven through Jesus Christ. Then he said, righteousness. She's on a Honda CBR. Hey, Micah. Micah, that's that motorcycle you wanted, man. CBR. My friend Micah wanted to get a CBR. He said, righteousness, because I go to the Father and you see me no more. You know, he's exalted to heaven. And then he said judgment because the prince of this world has been judged. Now, it is not natural for me, an ex-atheist, I used to be an atheist, it is not natural for me to want to confess that I'm a sinner. <clears throat> and um, my natural man is at war with God. And matter of fact, Scripture says the wrath of God abides on the sinful man. Now, I know a lot of people don't like talking about the wrath of God. But that's what Scripture says. The wrath of God abides on the sinful man. And i got a couple more minutes. And it also says that the natural man rebels against God. We're at war with God. Now, the simple fact of the matter that my natural man is drawn to God is proof and evidence that what Jesus Christ said is true, that, that this helper that Jesus talks about of convicting the world of sin, righteousness, judgment has come into the world and it's drawing people to this saving grace through Jesus Christ. It is not my natural desire to admit that I'm a sinner and I'm worthy of judgment. Who the heck, that's not, who the heck would want to admit that? That's not my natural man. That's a spiritual thing. That's the spirit that draws you towards this truth. So, ladies and gentlemen, before you go to shockonl.net and you click on a chat room and sign up for your own free chat room, they got a paid version there, but they also got a free one. You can sign up for the free one. Thanks for watching this. You just heard six very good reasons why it's rational to believe in God. The ontological argument, the cosmological argument, the teleological argument, the historical person Jesus Christ, objective moral values, and of course, number six, experiential reality, how we experience God in our lives. So God bless you guys. This is Shock, the ex-atheist that got two things, a brain and a heart. And it's great to be free from the ball and chain, the slavery of atheism. You have a great week.